Get used to seeing Lister and Rimmer marched over to Captain Hollister's desk. There's gonna be a lot of that in this episode. Also, their respective salutes. Anyway, it turns out they played a little prank on Ackerman by slipping him some truth serum. He rushed onto the bridge this morning, apologized for being late, saying he'd been having jiggy-jiggy with the science officer's wife and hadn't allowed enough time to change out of his Batman outfit. Permission to snigger, sir. Permission refused. You may have to snigger anyway, sir. These two are like BFFs all of a sudden. It's kind of adorable. I see Ackerman eventually got his glass eye back. You two are both serving a two-year sentence in the brig. Do you want to get out? Ever? Anyway, their excuse is that he's horrible. I'm extremely nice. That's why I entered the service, sir. So I could share my sunny disposition with inmate scum who didn't have my start in life. Flashback to their first day. Seems like a nice guy. <laughs> this is so hard for me to watch. Even Rimmer is wincing. Of course, Ackerman denies it. So anyway, Captain Hollister has an unusual punishment in mind. You and a team of your choice will play basketball against a team of guards led by Mr. Ackerman, where you will be trounced and humiliated in front of the entire inmate population. God, he's an asshole in season eight. <laughs> so the game happens and they're losing as expected, but they have an equally unusual revenge in mind. They've laced the other team's drinks with, well, basically Viagra. Within seconds, you're harder than a quadratic equation. And it doesn't wear off for seven hours. Try moving fast with a fishing pole in your pants. <laughs> and it works. I love Crichton cleaning the ball. <laughs> and our team wins. <laughs> and Captain Hollister just figured out what was going on. The actor who plays him had another idea of how to handle it. I thought Hollister should have been really proud of his kind of walked around and, yeah. I honestly think that would have been funnier. Maybe it wouldn't have worked with the following scene though. Afterwards, there they go again. <laughs> and again. I couldn't remove my shorts until after midnight. When I wanted a leak, I had to do a handstand on the toilet seat. <laughs> Serves you right. First thing tomorrow, you're on spud duty for two weeks. Now get out of my sight, both of you. Later on, it's dinner time, and of course, the food is terrible. Kill Crazy reckons to give us the cloning experiments that have gone wrong with some gravy slopped over to disguise it. Kill Crazy would say that. He reckons every time they flush a loo on a plane, it drops straight out. And that's why they don't let you go to the lab when the plane's standing on the runway, for fear of skid starts. Anyway, you'll notice that Lister isn't eating his. That's because he has a guy. Bob the Scudder. Chicken vindaloo. What about the poppadoms? You didn't forget them, did you? Here's a little something for you. Scutters are so cute. Is that the scutter who got you the stiffening solution for the basketball game? Turns out Bob is basically Morgan Freeman and can get anything. Rimmer and Lister start their potato peeling tomorrow, so they come up with an idea. What we want is one of those programmable viruses from the science block. So we could program them to eat the skins off the potatoes and leave the rest intact. So Lister sends the message through Morse code. Damn. Can he help us? No, wrong number. We've got the Chinese laundry. Do you need anything ironing? The next day, it's another canary mission. They're searching for a group that went missing. They find them alive, but frozen in time somehow. Apparently because of this device. Obviously, they used it erroneously. Don't mess with that thing, it can root. Early screw. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I love this guy. You up. It appears to be able to digitize time and then download it and store it on a hard drive. Uh, this pure time can then be uploaded into objects or places. So Crichton just immediately starts playing with it, which is a little out of character. Isn't he usually a little more concerned about possible side effects and such? Oh well. <laughs> Now it's regressed your outfits to a previous time in your life. I'm pretty sure neither of them were alive in the 60s, and Kat's race didn't even exist yet. Anyway, Kachansky has an idea. If we can smuggle this thing back on Red Dwarf, it can make our prison terms pass in seconds. I have an excellent place to conceal it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and how did the guard not see that? Come on. Then again, if they didn't notice anything unusual about Crichton, they must not be very observant. Later on, potato duty has started and Lister tries out the virus. It's working on this one. Yes. And here's another. And it works. Fan-smegging-tastic, Lister, we're on our way. A little too well, because they start eating their clothes. 
And hair. Be glad they stopped there, this could have gotten really dark. And there they go again. Rimmer and Lister fangirls rejoice. And fanboys. I like this new version of the Rimmer salute. If I ever, ever see you in this office again, then you're in the hole. Is that what you want? No, no sir. Well then, get out. Thank you, sir. Shaking his hand was not the best idea since they hadn't been to the meta bay yet. Two months in the hole! This machine's amazing. Do you think you can do boob jobs too? Uh, I'm just tired of complaining about Kachansky at this point. So now we're suddenly introduced to Baxter, who is this bully that they've had to put up with for a while, even though we're past the halfway point of the season and this is the first we're seeing of him. Also, Cat getting beat up isn't really funny to me. The scene with Ackerman kinda was, but eh, I'll go more into it in the Cat videos. So Crichton gets back at him by turning the chicken he was eating into, well, a chicken. Meanwhile, Rimmer and Lister are thrown into... solitary? That's not how solitary works. I know Captain Hollister said the whole, but that usually means solitary confinement. Oh well, plot convenience. And there's yet another guy in there. Surely, they call me Birdman. This is Pete. Uh, how long has this guy been in solitary? What the hell, Hollister? <laughs> anyway, it's Bob to the rescue. It turns out that Crichton has frozen everyone on the ship except them. Guys! Hey. Oh, sirs! <laughs> Buddies! This is Birdman. And this is Pete. You'll notice that every time Birdman says Pete's name, Pete sneezes. So Kachansky shares her idea about making their sentence pass faster with Lister and Rimmer. Also, Crichton fixes their hair. There's something wrong with Pete. But poor Pete dies. The excitement of being free has killed him. And Birdman is crushed. But Crichton attempts to turn back time on Pete and bring him back to life. Nice Jurassic Park reference there. But yeah, Crichton somehow set the dial back way too far and Pete is now a Tyrannosaurus Rex, the direct descendant of Sparrows, because that's how that works. Pete? Is that you, Pete? Here it comes. <laughs> And there's another reference to Jurassic Park. God bless you! Gesundheit. <laughs> you want some seed? That's a law then, is it? And so much for Birdman. What now, sir? Follow the rimmer-shaped blur. Or don't, whatever. Part 2 picks up right where Part 1 left off. Pete! Crichton tries to get Pete to eat him for some reason, and then he throws the time wand to Bob for safekeeping, I guess. But Pete follows the movement and... So much for Bob and the time wand. Come to think of it, that could be another reference to Jurassic Park. Come on, Crichton, hurry up! Though, other than being trapped in a stomach, Bob is okay. Leg it, monster! Stop yelling, man. We've got to think our way out of this. We finished! Kachansky has another idea. Get the T-Rex to pass the time wand quicker. Why don't we lure Pete into the food bay and get him to eat some roughage? All bran, prunes, baked beans on toast, that sort of stuff. We can't get Lister to eat that sort of stuff. They're not a seven-ton dinosaur. If we can recapture the time wand and turn Pete back into a sparrow before the freeze expires, no one need be any the wiser. Meanwhile, unfortunately, Bob just activated the time wand and unfroze everyone. A little later, they've prepared a bowl of food for the T-Rex. I love how they wrote Dino on it so he'd know it's for him. <laughs> anyway, it's Vindaloo. Gee, I wonder whose idea that was. And it includes a whole cow. Cow Vindaloo. It's not gonna work. T-Rexes don't like curry. If a T-Rex was a bloke, he'd be a Geordie. The kind of guy who wears t-shirts in the middle of winter and his nipples don't even get hard. I buy that. If the worst comes to the worst and the dino doesn't eat it, I'll scoff at myself. I buy that too. I think Lister is looking forward to it already. <laughs> don't put that stuff in, you gotta spoil the taste! So here comes Pete, so they all hide and wait to see what'll happen. And Pete likes it. <laughs> I think he wants a lager. 
but it doesn't like him. And here come the guards, followed by this again. And this. The T-Rex ended up raiding their food supplies. And you know what happens when a dinosaur eats cow vindaloo and then eats two and a half tons of mint chalk ice cream, swills the whole thing down with 2,000 gallons of a popular fizzy drink? And do you know what happened to the poor, brave men who had the misfortune to get in the way of that burp? They went, Phew. No, actually it knocked them clear across the cargo bay. But apparently after that, he ate more of all that stuff. It didn't get a diet eat attack, did it? And do you know what happened to the battalion that was sneaking up on the beast from behind, of which I was a proud member? Do you know? A tidal wave. 15 feet high. Yikes. But only Lister and Rimmer and their friends know how the time wand works, so Captain Hollister tells them to go back to the cargo bay and turn the dinosaur back into a bird. What about Bob? Did he show him? Who the hell do you think landed on my head? Good to know Bob is okay. And if I ever, ever see you in this office again, you are finished. See you in 10 minutes. <laughs> see you in 10 minutes. This gag is really random and goes on for a long time. A little later... He is a good captain, though, Captain Hollister, isn't he? Hey, on the ball. Quick. Quick? The only time he's quick is when he's passing a salad bar. Oh, God, Rimmer, how many times are you gonna let this happen? You do respect him, don't you? Respect him? And his idea of a light snack, he's standing behind me, isn't he? Yes, he is. I was saying what a big fat lump of blubber I think you are. <laughs> and how that potato virus I contracted yesterday doesn't appear to have had any strange side effects whatsoever. <laughs> Smooth, Rimmer. You left it in my office. Do you have any idea the damage that this could cause if it got into the wrong hands? Look after it! The fist biting is back too. Because this episode didn't have nearly enough subplots, Kachansky thinks she's found a mouse. It's not a mouse, ma'am, it's Archie. But it turns out to be that Crichton made himself a penis with a mind of its own, and it escaped. It means you're a real man. It does? Why? Because now, like all men, you have absolutely no control over your penis. Zing. Well, if that gives my thing don't work, Captain says we gotta go in and have that tea, Rex. Oh, Kill Crazy is back. The guns are for wusses. It's gonna be answer and combat. A fist fight with a T Rex. <laughs> yeah, but them T Rexes, mate, they only got little arms, and they? Can't reach anything with them little arms. That's probably why they're always a bit grumpy. Hey, T-Rex doesn't need to masturbate. He gets all the ladies. A little later, the canaries are on their way out when Cat suddenly has a problem. Something's inside me and it wants to get out. <laughs> what is it? I think it's Archie, sir. Well, that pointless subplot is over already. Who the smack is Archie? Don't be alarmed, sir. It's just my penis is on the loose. I do appreciate the alien reference, though. So, Baxter and Kill Crazy are idiots who want to fight the T-Rex. So, Baxter gets the time wand from Lister and tries to use it on him and Rimmer. But he doesn't really know what he's doing. So, he beats them up. According to this, sirs, they put your bodies on a different time stream to the rest of you. But they're lagging, basically. Back to Captain Hollister they go. You get that time wand back, you get that sparrow back, and if you step out of line one more time, one more time, you're dead! And now they've caught up with Baxter and Kill Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Captain Hollister has no idea what's going on. <laughs> that didn't really make sense, but it was cute. I don't think getting it back is going to be much of a problem. So they go back to find that Baxter and Kill Crazy have de-evolved themselves, but not by much. <laughs> it's not often I can say a T-Rex reminds me of my cat. Something's gonna go wrong, it always does for us. So Lister brings back Birdman. Pete ate me. He must be really out of sorts, he's never eaten me before. I get a kick out of him. And puts Pete back the way he was. Pete? You want some seed? Aww. 
and then he destroys the time wand. Except that apparently Pete laid an egg at some point, and obviously they can't put the time wand back together. <laughs> I think I've seen this cartoon before. Anyway, the baby dino escapes to an elevator and the doors close before they can get in. Meanwhile, Captain Hollister is getting a massage, and I think we know where this is going. <laughs> and they're off again. Turns out that Captain Hollister is unable to speak due to PTSD. <laughs> and he's sending himself to the hole just to get away from them. And so ends Pete. With the basketball game, Baxter, the potatoes, Crichton's penis, and the baby dino, boy did this episode have a lot of subplots. They could have easily cut out all of those and just had this be a one-parter. And it's kind of weird because the following episode is the season finale, so if any episode would be a two-parter, you'd think it'd be that one, and not the random episode that came before it. Well, that was originally going to be the plan. What ended up happening was that they spent a lot of money on the CG T-Rex, and they basically blew the rest of the budget. So they added a lot of padding to the Pete story so it would spread over two episodes. Yeah, letting the budget write the plot doesn't always end with the best results. That is one big pile of shit. Yeah, yeah. Honestly though, I don't hate this episode. It is way too bloated, but like the rest of season 8, I do think the jokes are funny and there's a lot of quotable lines. Also, I may be a bit biased. I just think it's kind of cool seeing a CG dinosaur in a Red Dwarf episode. Yeah, it's not the best quality CG, but come on, what did you expect? I guess I'm just kind of impressed that they even attempted it. Also, all the little nods to Jurassic Park, which is one of my top five favorite movies of all time. Plus, I get a kick out of the visual of a T-Rex sleeping on its back with its feet in the air. Where else are you going to see that? And I'll be damned if I don't love Captain Hollister. I just get a kick out of seeing him so mad at Lister and Rimmer. He's a bit too mean at times in Season 8, but the actor just plays him so well. I also really got a kick out of this running gag. Both parts of it. I guess that's about all I have to say about this one. It's probably the most disorganized season 8 episode, but I still enjoy it. Next up is a season finale, only the good. See you then. There's no cat saying which has particular relevance here. It goes something like this. We are all gonna die. <laughs>